Hey, this is Sandy. And Randy. And we're here on AT Corner. Being an athletic trainer comes with ups and downs, and we're here to showcase it all. Join us as we share our world in sports medicine. Welcome back to another episode of AT Corner. For our education episode this week, we are going to talk about the meniscus. Menisci. We're going to talk about both. Definitely menisci. That is the plural. (laughs) That is definitely the plural. So this is a CEU episode. If you are listening to it as it comes out, well, first of all, uh, we will be airing the CEU on November 17th. So if you're looking for that CEU, it's not in the show notes just yet if you're listening to it right as this comes out. Um, So make sure you come back to the show notes for your CEU. Um, If you're listening to it as it it comes out, um, it is a free CEU. If it's in within our last three CEU episodes, it will be a dollar and any others before that will be regularly priced. Thanks to Mass General Brigham. Yes, thank you very much, for sure. And do you want to tell us what we're talking about? Yeah, so we're going to describe the relevant anatomy of the menisci of the knee. We'll talk about the evaluation process for a patient that you kind of suspect, hey, we might be looking at a torn meniscus here. Uh, We'll look at the focus areas for treatment and rehabilitation, and then we'll discuss some return to play considerations after a meniscus tear, which is already kind of interesting because it's like, okay, did they have surgery? Did they not have surgery? So, Which I'm sure we've all had someone with both. Oh, yes, most definitely, for sure. So as you gathered from the, uh, the first objective that we talked about is it's anatomy time. Nothing like anatomy on the commute to work. So, as we mentioned before, right, there are two meniscuses, the menisci, right? We have the medial and the lateral on both knees. Uh, The medial is a little bit more C-shaped, and it covers about 50 to 60% of the uh, articular surface on the medial side of the knee. Your lateral is a little bit more circular, and it's going to cover a lot more of that articular space on the lateral side. Uh, I think they measured it to about 70 to 80% of it being covered by the meniscus, so... It could see some potential on possibility of damage because there's more meniscus covering um, that lateral side of your knee. So a lot more opportunity to get caught and torn. On the lateral side? Yes. Because there's more? Because it's covering more. So that means it's in Hmm. contact with the femur a little bit more. I guess I never really thought about that. I'm trying to think of the... I've had two bucket handle meniscus tears. I'm trying to think of if they were medial or lateral. I feel like one of them was medial. Okay. And I, I really can't remember the second one. I think all my patients that I've had with meniscus has been lateral. Hmm. Yeah. Um, and now as we dive into more of the meniscus, right, we got to talk about the blood supply. And I think this is something that everyone's pretty familiar with when we start talking about the meniscus because it's a whole key thing on... Um, the management plan and the patient education. Mm-hmm. So, as we know, the blood supply is really limited to limited to about a third of the uh, meniscus, right? So, it's about ten to thirty percent of that peripheral section. So, the section that's kind of closer to the skin, right? That kind of outside section, right? This is referred to the red zone. So, if you ever hear people talking about the different zones of the meniscus, the red zone is, well where it gets blood, hence the red part. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Um, And one of the articles I was reading actually had like a cool like cross section of like, I think it was, it was some kind of imaging that it actually showed like the vessels and you can see like an abrupt stop. Oh, wow. Yeah. It was really kind of cool to kind of help visualize just how limited the vascular supply actually is. I wonder why that is. That is a good question. I wonder if there was mo- if there were more blood supply, it'd create more problems. I mean, obviously, there's a reason why it's not. Yeah, this was the most successful by evolution, <laughs> so <laughs> that's what we're going with. Uh, the innermost third, right? This is your avascular zone. Uh, this is referred to as the white zone, right? Because there's really no vascular. It's literally just the that pearly white tissue that you always see on, in like on like arthroscopy and stuff. Yeah. Yep. Um, and then the middle third is just that transition zone, right? It's the it's referred to as the red white, right? There's eh, there's some blood vessels, maybe uh, also kind of not. So it's that kind of middle ground. I feel like anatomy is usually pretty straightforward, but this is like really straightforward. Like red means blood, yep. white means no blood, red white means some blood. You know, anatomy is already <laughs> tough as it is. We try to make it easier on ourselves as best we can. <laughs> right. Um, now if we're talking about blood, let's talk about the nervous supply. Uh, the nervous supply is very similar to 
uh, the blood vessels, right? It's basically that peripheral third is what's actually innervated by nerves, right? So this kind of gives you an idea how some patients may have a meniscus tear, but really may really may not have pain with it. Mostly they might have the, the mechanical symptoms of like locking or clicking, but maybe mm-hmm. not have pain associated with it because there's not really a lot of innervation on the inside um, on those like kind of those two thirds of the meniscus. So I never really consider this. This is actually really... Um, interesting, interesting right yeah. yeah right so if if you're if you're seeing someone with pain that has a meniscus tear they might have like that peripheral kind of third involved in that as well hmm. and that's also the spot that you can kind of get to in the joint line exactly 100 percent um so now that we kind of understand the structure of hey what the hell a meniscus is, what the meniscus is now let's talk about the function, right? And I think everyone has a pretty solid idea of what it is, but there are some that I thought was kind of interesting as well. Um, it's really good for load transmission. So the idea of the menisci are they divert stress away from the articular cartilages, right? Which also, I knew this was going to come up because lately, not just lately, but like in the last probably two years, I feel like I've had more articular cartilage damage than... I have like in the rest of just in as a student in the Uh beginning of my career and interesting um I guess I in our program we didn't really stress articular cartilage so I think when I saw it for the first time I didn't really understand it and now that I've seen it a couple times it really does mimic meniscus yeah I mean when you think about it like the the type of tissues are fairly you know common or like very fairly similar and they're both kind of trying to do a, a job. It's just the meniscus is trying to save the articular cartilage because there's a lot more innervation there and like stuff like that. And right, that's interesting. Right. Um, so essentially, right, we're trying to divert stress away from the articular cartilages, right? Because there's a mismatch in shape between the femoral condyles and the tibial plateau, right? The femoral condyle is a little more rounded, whereas the tibial plateau is really kind of just flat, mm-hmm. right? So you can tell that that wouldn't be very smooth, as you're no. walking and putting weight on, right? So the mini- the menisci are there to kind of help smooth that out, kind of absorb some of that, right? Um, interestingly, the lateral side transmits more load compared to the medial side, right? And again, it kind of leans into what we were talking about. It's like, oh, I feel like I've seen more lateral or, you mm-hmm. know, so. Mm-hmm. And again, it, it kind of shows why the the lateral meniscus is shaped the way it is, how much it covers, right? Because just how our gait is, that lateral side's getting a lot of force, well, when you go into full knee flexion, don't you get more lateral contact? Yes, I believe so, yeah. Um, the next task is shock absorption, right? And, you know, you have a, a tissue that's pretty much filled with predominantly fluid, right? It's going to be able to absorb a lot of shock. Um, I don't think this one gets talked about a lot, but the menis- the menisci do have a stability role, um, especially that medial meniscus, Right, the literature has referred to it as a secondary stabilizer to the ACL. Um, this is due to a lot of like the menisci have very strong attachments, one to themselves and also to um, to the actual tibia. Um, and you also have to consider that the medial meniscus also has connections with the MCL as well. So uh, studies have shown that in ACL deficient knees. There's increased force that's actually going through the medial meniscus, which is showing that, hey, the medial meniscus is working harder to help stabilize the knee. Um, And then in those with ACL deficient knees, if they take that medial meniscus out, they actually see an increase in um, uh, anterior tibial translation. Hmm. Yeah, right? I thought that was kind of interesting. I I figured that they had some kind of role in stability, but to kind of think that the medial meniscus has a pretty big role in helping the ACL, I thought was very interesting. Right, especially because the medial meniscus is the one that covers less of the articular surface. I know, exactly. What I also thought was interesting was the medial meniscus is a lot more stable compared to the lateral. The Mm -hmm. lateral meniscus actually has to move a little bit to actually track with the lateral femoral condyle. Oh, I interesting. Thought, yeah, I thought that was very interesting. Which is also weird because, again, the lateral covers more articular surface. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. And then the last task that's kind of brought out there is the actual lubrication of the joint. Uh, the menisci, when they're compressed, they actually help circulate synovial fluid throughout the knee. 
as we know, synovial fluid is very important to getting nutrition to all the structures within the knee itself. So that, you know, about two thirds of the meniscus that doesn't get any blood supply. This is how it stays alive. Right. right? Is that synovial fluid, which keep synovial fluid in the back of your head as we continue this lecture. It is a joint. It is a joint. That's right. Okay, so anatomy, check. Let's move into evaluation. Yes. So as with any evaluation, and if you remember when you were a student, or if you still are a student, you've probably heard, the history is very important. Mm -hmm. You get pretty much everything you need to know right even before you start doing your tests, right? So understanding the mechanism is very important, right? Most common way the meniscus is the menisci are damaged is through a weight bearing, cutting and pivoting mo- motion, right? And it just makes sense, right? You're compressing the tissue and then you add some like torsion because you're doing a cutting or pivoting, right? So you're basically just trying to grab it and just. <laughs> We're good with the sound effects here, guys. That was that was the meniscus tearing. Um, Who knew we would be so gory today? <laughs> All right, so that's kind of a big key to really start kind of thinking, okay, we might be looking at a meniscus, right? And then also uh, if there's any clicking or catching, right? If they're talking about, oh, my knee locks at this angle and I have to force it out or like, oh, it clicks every time it gets here, right? That That's a problem. Mm-hmm. That, that's not great. So after you get that history done, now we can dive into the special tests for meniscus. Now, when you take the special tests in isolation, they're really not that great for detecting meniscus tears. Right, McMurray's, I think the sensitivity was reported to be a very big range of 21 (laughs) to 72%. It's a lot. Uh, The specificity was also a big range, and it it was around 34 to 94%. Wow. Right? Um, And McMurray's was really, the numbers were stronger for ruling in a lateral lesion compared to a medial. Right, again, Interesting. There's, there's just more tissue there that I think you could pick up on. I also feel like McMurray's is way easier to do to stress the lateral I agree. side. Yeah. I feel like just in general, like just getting that knee towards you to stress the medial yeah. side is just a little tougher. That's a good point. I didn't think Especially of it Especially like way. where your body is in compressing because at least you can use your body force to compress the lateral side as yeah. you push into valgus. Yeah, that's true. I didn't think of that. Um. Of course, everyone's favorite, Thessaly's, right? That, again, that didn't really have that much superior of numbers, right? Sensitivity was between 31 and 64%. Um, Specificity was around 40 to 95%. And really, a lot of these numbers, we're looking at it with the test performed at 20 degrees because there are two two levels that you're supposed to do. I think Mm -hmm. it's like 5 and 20 Mm -hmm. uh, degrees of knee flexion. Um, Again, the lateral lesion was easier to detect compared to the medial. Hmm. I feel like this one, um, especially when I'm teaching students, this one I have to really stress that you have to pay attention to like the patella Mm -hmm. and if they're having pain on uh, like patellar surface or patellar tendon because that can also mask this test as well. Oh, 100%. Like, oh yeah, I have pain. Well, yeah, if you have pain in the anterior knee, like... yeah. It's going to hurt when you load it. 100%. And that's where that history comes into play too, Mm -hmm. right? Like if Mm -hmm. you don't have the mechanism for a meniscus tear, right? Like your cross country kid that comes in with like, oh, my knee hurts and didn't pivot or cut. Like your positive test is not that concerning to me. Quote unquote positive, I should say. Right. Um, And then like we talked about before is the joint line tenderness. And by far, this actually is one of the best ones in isolation. Hmm. The sensitivity was around 68%. Specificity ran between 76 and uh, 97%. And again, the trend of the lateral one being easier to identify continues. That that it was also the case for joint line tenderness. Hmm. So as with most special tests, we just don't do one and call it a day. A combination of McMurray's and Thessaly's did help a little bit, but it wasn't super significant. But if you combined McMurray's or Thessaly's with joint line tenderness, it actually had a really big um, effect on how good they were at identifying these structures. It can Mm -hmm. reach sensitivity of 90% and specificity of 99%. So that's pretty solid. Right. Um, There was a clinical prediction rule that I found that I feel like... I feel like I don't remember talking about this in school, so I thought it was kind of interesting because the article that talked about it was 
was fairly older. Like I would say it was probably about 15, 17 years old. Honestly, I feel like clinical prediction rules aren't really stressed in school, but now the students that I have are, they're teaching me more clinical prediction rules. And I'm like, oh wow, I didn't ever know about these. Well, I feel like when, when we were in school, like I feel like they were like, there weren't a lot for athletics. Mm. Like, I feel like a lot of it was like just general population stuff, which is always really hard to translate to athletes, right? especially when one of the criteria for whatever rule you're looking at was above the age of 50. <laughs> it's not, it's not going to work for my high school or college student athlete. Right. Right. So, um, but I do, I agree. I think it is becoming a lot more popular now. And I think mm-hmm. that that just shows how we're evolving mm-hmm. with the literature, you know, that's starting to come right. out. Right. Um, so the clinical prediction rule went off of history of locking or catching, pain with forced hyperextension, pain in full flexion. So if you push them all the way in maximal flexion. Because that's where you get most of the contact. Yep. Uh, pain and or a click with McMurray's and joint line tenderness. If you have all five of those in place, there was a 92% uh, predictive value that there is a meniscus tear. Honestly, I feel like... Those are literally everything for meniscus anyway. So I feel like this clinical prediction rule, like even though like I'm glad they studied it, but yes. I feel like that's kind of stuff that we talk about anyway. Yes. Although um, pain with forced hyperextension, that's... that. Yeah, that was kind of a cool one to kind of see. Um, if it, if there's just three of those present, that uh, um, that kind of positive predictive value drops down to just over 75%. Still fairly, fairly good, right? Um, so basically if you have a combination of things that you're kind of hinting at meniscus, you might want to rule out meniscus, right? So that's, that's kind of my takeaway with this. Like, Hey, if you're doing a combination of these things and you're kind of like, ah, man, just all these things are positive. The mechanisms there. Hey, maybe, maybe let's kind of rule out a meniscus issue. Or if they've had an MCL tear in the past or sprain, um, our doc likes to see all MCL tears, even like uh, grade one sprains because oh, of cool. the meniscus involvement. Yeah. Oh, um, cool. Also, if you are unable to move their knee, like if, if you get them to lock, then that's indicative like bucket handle tear. Yeah. Or if they have a history of meniscus tears, then you might start thinking articular cartilage. Like I've had the, the couple that I've seen they've just they've been active they've been functional but their knee swells up with activity yeah and so you know we kind of do some meniscus tests there's some that are positive and a lot of it it's just like with the grinding or you know did you read anything about um aptly's compression test or distraction Uh, not the test itself uh the ones that i had didn't compare it but it it runs about the same as with the other ones interesting that one I feel like I use as a like a last resort because I don't like really flipping them too much. But, <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, if a lot of times what I've seen for articular cartilage is just the um, mm-hmm. presence of swelling, like idiopathic swelling, it seems like. And then they come in and we're doing the tests and they're just, you know, painful with some, but not yeah. like specific. It could be meniscus tear. And then all of a sudden imaging shows articular cartilage. Yeah, for sure. So now that we did our evaluation, we have an idea, hey, your meniscus is Swiss cheese at this point. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it, zero to 100 real quick here. Uh, now we got to talk about the treatment and the rehab. And basically treatment can either go a conservative route or a surgical. Um, a lot of what I was kind of reading is conservative is kind of a, a nice first approach. They kind of want to attack that first just because the options for surgical really aren't that great i mean you could try to repair it but the problem is is there's only such a small window of what can be repaired i um, mean a small window like a uh, area or yeah, a small window of time a small window of area because okay. of the uh only a third of the meniscus has blood supply mm-hmm. so that's about a third of healing potential mm-hmm. there's some spots that hey if it's kind of like that kind of in the middle maybe they might try to repair it mm-hmm. um but Again, that's it's such a small option. Um, most of the time, what you'll see is that partial meniscectomy, right? They're going to take part of that meniscus out, smooth it out, make it look all nice, and you know, clean up the frayed ends. Exactly, right? Try to make it as smooth as possible so it can continue doing its job 
And then one that I think is going to get obviously a lot more um, attention going forward and like with the advances of biological kind of medicine in general, uh, there was some people who have done a meniscus transplant. I know one thing's going to be uh, like using using biologics like PRP and like stuff like that, stem cells going into the future. So that might change this. But right now you're kind of like your big ones are either a repair or you're looking at a partial meniscectomy. All right. So even depending on what route you kind of go, right? Rehabilitation is going to be guided on if there was surgery, what was the procedures done? What was the procedure done? And what is the surgeon's protocol? Um, as with most, so that is definitely going to be one thing to kind of talk to your physician about what they're comfortable with. Um, cause there are going to be some differences between a repair and a meniscectomy, right? A repair, they're going to probably not be weight bearing a little bit longer. Um, Whereas a partial meniscectomy, they're a little bit more accelerated with stuff like that, just because you're not trying to protect necessarily a tissue repairing. Um, as with most lower extremity pathologies, we're probably going to focus on the glutes, right? Got to get those bad boys strong. If you control your knee, um, f- you know, through space, it's going to take a lot of pressure off. And obviously that weight bearing component, right? Force has to go through the hip. So let's make sure the hips are prepared to, um, absorb that force, right? And literature has shown those that have had a partial uh, meniscectomy have had increases in knee ad- adduction moments, so that medial side of the knee is getting overloaded, which could be bad for articular cartilage, future meniscus, or if the medial meniscus was the one damaged, mm-hmm. it can hurt that even more, mm-hmm. right? Or put more stress to it. Um, really fast going back, so I was just looking real quick to find um, the name of... so. We were looking at this MRI and there was just like a like a line straight through the meniscus. Oh my gosh. Um and that's called a radial tear of the meniscus and um this is something that we end up having one of our athletes um get uh repaired because our team doc mm-hmm. was like that's it's unstable it's going to it's going to um cause more damage later and yeah. like now that we're talking about like the stability aspect of Mm -hmm. it and especially like how that lateral meniscus moves to kind of still articulate um it makes sense like that i've never seen that full thickness but it was literally like a line straight through the meniscus yeah and that's also going to guide what kind of surgical procedure slash rehab's done is just the type of tear that's in there right um another thing that i forgot to bring up for the evaluation part because this actually came up just recently with one of my student athletes you know i had an athlete present with like this giant bump on the lateral side Mm -hmm. of his knee and it was right at lateral joint line and i'm like what the hell is this like i thought it was maybe like scar tissue like some kind of like cyst thing because it wasn't like fluidy but it wasn't like super hard Mm -hmm. and looking into it i believe it's uh what's termed a um a meniscal cyst so he has a lateral meniscal cyst and he has a history of a torn meniscus that didn't have any surgical like intervention mm-hmm. right and i don't think he really did conservative care for it they just told him hey you kind of have a torn meniscus and he this was when i think when he was 12 oh wow and he's like 18 19 That's now young. and he's still having issues so mm-hmm. um essentially what a meniscal cyst is there's a tear in the meniscus and in this kind of condition synovial fluid actually leaks out of the joint creating the cyst interesting so if you see a student athlete that has and it it can it can occur on the medial side i believe the lateral is a little bit more common it sounds like lateral is more common for a lot of things a lot of things um so if you see someone with a bump at their knee that's right on lateral joint line you might want to think that's a meniscal cyst which means Mm -hmm there might be a meniscus tear associated with that. Mm -hmm. So another evaluation tip for you. Um, Back to the rehab component, right? So we definitely strengthen the hips, right? Get those glutes nice and strong. Also, as with any kind of knee surgery or knee trauma, right? At some point, we are going to have to involve the the knee strengthening component. After a meniscus surgery, there's a decrease in the quadriceps rate of torque development, right? So it's not good at quickly developing torque. Um, there's also decreased knee extension moments during running. So essentially the body's like, nope, mm-mm, I am not, I am not using my knee. I'm going to try and use something else. 
Right. Right. Which seems like when you hear that, like, oh, that kind of could be good. But right. It's going to lead to more stress to other areas. Right. So Mm -hmm. we want to get those, the knee nice and strong, get the quads nice and strong. So the body knows that it can, hey, I can use this. Right. And we want to make sure that we are teaching people how to move correctly. Right. Like, let's break those adaptations that the body initially did to protect itself for that long-term gain, right? So motor control and motor learning is going to be very important along with the strengthening component. Right. I believe in our last story episode, we talked about some courses and this is where one of the courses becomes very important. One manual therapy technique, because I mean, really when you talk about meniscus, like how many manual therapy techniques can you think of that might be beneficial, right? A lot of it's like pain stuff or swelling. Or like stuff for the quad yeah, or like the right. surrounding. Well, uh, the mul- the mulligan concept, their mobilization with movement, has been shown to actually be very effective in decreasing pain and increasing function in those with a clinically diagnosed uh, meniscus tear. Well, I mean, if you think about it, like we talked about this in our last episode as well, but... We learned so many manual therapy techniques for the musculoskeletal aspect of the body. And I feel like we don't really talk about how to treat the joint effectively. Yeah. And I think that's why Mulligan stuck so well with us because yeah. it's, it is a manual therapy approach that you can really focus on things like, and the biggest example that I always use is like a finger sprain. Yeah. What are you going to do with a finger sprain other than like massage the swelling out? Yeah. And strengthen, well, like actually treating the joint. Um, that's a perfect idea for yeah. meniscus. Oh, and my thing too was I just love the instant results. It's just like instant, like decrease in pain. Right. Like that's that's awesome. Right. Um, in particular, when we talk about like meniscus, right, it's either going to be the squeeze technique, which is literally you just are basically shoving your thumbs <laughs> into the, the joint line of like whatever side hurts. And then you're just having them go through a full knee range of motion, right? And then they also have the tibial external rotation or tibial internal rotation, right? Essentially, you're going to try and see whatever takes their pain away the most, right? Ideally, it should be gone. It should be pain-free, mm-hmm. right? So whatever one gives you those better results, that's the one you're going to work with. I mean, that's kind of like um, the taping that you would do. for. There are two tapes that I know that I do slash other clinicians that I know do Mm -hmm. um for meniscus and one is well the one that i use the most often is a tibial internal or external rotation tape so where you just start with just um your base layer of like pre-rep and light blast for example um two heel and lace pads right Mm -hmm. behind the knee joint i'm kind of like in that popliteal area just so the tape doesn't irritate them yeah And then taking elasticon and placing it on the tibia. And then, well, I mean, before I tape, I determine like, okay, I externally rotate their tibia and I say, does this feel better? Or I internally rotate their tibia and I say, or does this feel better? Yeah. And then I place the elasticon on the tibia. And most of the time I'm pulling externally. Yeah. Pull externally and then wrap it behind their knee in that popliteal space and then up to their thigh. Mm -hmm. And then usually I do two strips and then I just cover. Yep. And then um, another one that some of my other clinician friends do, or they'll take a, um, they'll like roll up a piece of like white tape or Luco or Mm -hmm. um, something. So it's like a straight line, kind of like when you roll tape. Yeah. And then um, they'll fold it. So it's like literally like a little worm. (laughs) And then you put it in that joint line. I've seen that. And then just strap it on with Luco or use a, um, those, that fold technique where you like Mm -hmm. put the, sticky to sticky on the luco and then like use it as a lever and like pull it over yeah i don't know if that makes sense if you've never seen it but like a mcconnell kind of deal yeah kind of like a kind of like a mcconnell but just basically like putting pressure in that joint yeah yeah i've seen i've seen that one so those are kind of exactly what the mulligan techniques are just taped yeah yeah for sure and they do have self ones right so there are some that the patient can do on themselves so if Mm -hmm. if they like the way you did it but hey you're not going to see them for a few days hey that might be good for Or like, hey, you don't travel with them and they're at like an away event, right? Mm -hmm. They could do it on themselves. Um, So now that we did the rehab, did our treatment, the Swiss cheese isn't as Swissy. So that's right. That's a new one. (laughs) Uh, Now we got to talk about that return to play. And again, like with any of the pathologies you talked about, especially when we're talking about post-surgical, all right, there should be some kind of system that you have in 
your return to play decision making, right? We should be using our functional tests, right? Can they be, can they do athletic things, right? And they can, mm-hmm. can they do them as, I don't want to say normal, but like as normal as like they should be able to, or compare right. to their right. non affected leg, mm-hmm. right? Are they strong enough to be able to, um, do sport, right? Is it again, comparable to the non affected leg or maybe a baseline, right? Um, and then of course, you know, getting the patient's like feeling on it, right? How do they feel about their function, right? Are they able to do these things? Are they still hesitant about things, right? Are they actually ready to return to play, right? These are all consider considerations that go into making that decision of return to play. Now, obviously, if you're going like a conservative route, like middle of the season kind of thing, right, That that's also going to play a role. Like, does the athlete need to return during the season, right? Like, are right. they a scholarship athlete? And like, this is a big deal. Or if they're at like, say, like a high school or a junior college, right? Are they getting looks for scholarship that, Hey, if they're not playing anymore, are they going to miss out on that? Right. Mm-hmm. So, or for your professional athletes, right? Like are, we're ta- we could be talking about millions of dollars, right? So, right. <laughs> so there's a lot that goes into the, the equation. A lot of times, especially when I'm talking to my athletes that are, Hey, I want to play through this kind of thing. I just try to make sure that they know, Hey, that's fine. It's possible. It's doable, but it's going to be a lot of work. We got to do all this rehab stuff like this. And also you're going to have good days and bad days. All right, there's going to be days you don't really feel it and it feels all right. And then there's going to be days you feel like crap. All right. And I've, I've, I've like, I've seen that, right. I've, I've had a hurdler who early in the season found that we had, he had a torn meniscus. He actually had what was called a discoid meniscus, which is just how the meniscus develops. The collagen within it is a lot weaker and there's like the development of the ligaments of the meniscus as well are different. So it actually moves a lot more. Like it's, it's, it was kind of interesting to learn about it, uh, but he made it through an entire season. And again, there were days he's like, man, I feel great. And then there were some days he's like, dude, I, I couldn't get past my warm up. I'm like, yeah, yeah, that's how it's going to be. Usually, <laughs> hey, he did well at conference. I was just saying, usually after we determine that are functional, I'll usually sit down and talk to him. Like, listen, like this is a playable injury. Mm-hmm. Yours specifically, um, but it's going to hurt and yep. you know, we, we just have to take it day by day to try to figure out what we can do to mitigate that. Yeah, for sure. For What's sure. your action item? The meniscus is cool. Oh, <laughs> um, <laughs> I would say the biggest thing is pay attention to the history and the mechanism, right? And then Make sure you're using a combination of tests to help guide that. Just because one test is positive doesn't necessarily mean you're looking at the pathology, right? Get all the information at once and then go with that decision. And then, of course, strengthen the lower extremity. Mm-hmm. Get those glutes ready. Mm-hmm. I feel like that's an action for a lot of things. Yep. Um, Even for upper extremity. <laughs> true, true. <laughs> I would say don't be... Um, don't be suspicious. Thanks. That's a great action item. Um, actually do be suspicious yeah. that it could be an articular That's cartilage. True. Don't forget about that. Um, Osteochondral. Or that. Lesions, right? Right. right. That's good stuff. Mm-hmm. So if you guys are interested in that CU, just make sure you, show, you scroll down to the show notes below. And again, if you're listening to this as it comes out, um, the CU will not be available until November 17th. Um, and then other than that, we do every other episode as education or stories. This one was an education episode. Next week, we're going back to our stories. So make sure you check that out. Um, if you'd like to submit a story, you can email us or you can go to our Instagram at AT Corner Podcast, or you can go to our Facebook group, facebook.com slash group slash AT Corner Podcast, where we're going to post a question of the week. Do you know what the question of the week is? Not yet. Something about meniscus. It's going to be something about <laughs> meniscus for sure. Um, so head over there, meet other clinicians, talk about clinician things. <laughs> yes, definitely talk about clinician things. Um, and then, yeah, have a great rest of your week. Got anything else, Randy? Nope. That was perfect. Thank you for helping us showcase athletic training behind the tape. Bye.